I'm, I'm sure you can see my slides. Yep, we got it here. Yep, we got it here. Okay. So we're going to talk about so, uh, taking action in heart failure management with Dr. Adafe from Porta Core, University of Porta Core Hospital. If you want to take it away, sir. Yeah. So thank you very much. So we'll just look very briefly in the next uh, 20 to 25 minutes that, um, that along um, uh, the number of years, uh, decades in the past, a number of things have gone up in the management of heart failure, uh, from clinical trials to observational study to meta-analysis that have driven down uh, to various modifications in the guidelines and various um, op uh, expert opinion here and there that have shaped the management of heart failure. Uh, despite that, uh, you still have great challenges and unmet needs in the management of heart failure. So today's materials uh, precisely would mainly will be drawn from these three sources shown here. So this, we just look at it very briefly from medication to devices to other, then we just take the uh, take home points. Now, looking at uh, the issue of uh, medications, uh, first thing is the RAS uh, pathway that a number of us look at in management of heart failure with reduced uh, ejection fraction. And also RAS pathway two have also come up even in the management of mid-range ejection fraction and sometime in the uh, ejection fraction less than uh, 60, and also among women with ejection fraction even above uh, uh, 60. So the question here is that how do we consider in choosing uh, any over ACI or ARB as a component of the RAS uh, pathway? Uh, when you look at the 2021 uh, um, uh, uh, HF, uh, HFA uh, ESC uh, heart failure guidelines. The first thing is that the each of these RAS pathway they are all uh, class one uh, recommendation. You talk about uh, the ACI, the ANI, the beta blocker, the MRA, uh, then the dapagliflozin, then the loop diuretics. The loop diuretics are actually used for people who a uh, volume overload so that you can reduce that and maintain uh, a lean body weight for them. Then they don't uh, have mortality benefit, but they also, uh, they have um, improved, uh, there is a decreased number of hospital stay when they are incorporated into uh, the therapy. So for those that have a QRS complex less than uh, 35, but they are not qualified for a, CR, um, a CROT, uh, those people can be uh, considered for uh, ICD, which is a device in heart failure. And um, um, if you look at uh, ischemic and non-ischemic, obviously ischemic is class one in ICD, why non-ischemic is a class two A. And most of the reason why ischemic is considered class one is because of uh, the, the tend to generate more arrhythmia because ICD is actually for uh, an arrhythmia issue. The reason why ICD does not, does not tell you whether the heart failure will progress down the line or it will remain uh, the same, uh, it will remain the same or it will improve. That is not the purpose of implantation of ICD. Or like the CROT where when you implant it, you think of, whether they have feel the patient will improve, that is, um, or and improve uh, to the point that the patient may not even need medication again. And in that class, in that case, you can cl uh, uh, classify them as um, a super response. So then, for those that are having a um, ejection fraction above uh, 35, uh, or the vast therapy is not indicated, what we just need to do is to optimize their medication. Then for those that have um, ejection fraction less than 35%, and uh, they are also qualified, the QRS complex from the ECG also qualify them uh, as by level of LBB, uh, that is uh, LBB that is above, the QRS complex is above 150, that is class one, or they have uh, LBB, uh, LBB that is between uh, 130 to 149, or they have a non-ROBB that is uh, above uh, one, um, 
150, that is class two uh, a, a recommendation. So such group of people can be taken for either a CROTP or to be taken for a CROTD. So these are the way the guideline keep uh, uh, shuffling them. Then uh, it's also recommended that uh, if you look at the same guideline, it tells us that uh, when a patient is, uh, is suitable, uh, there's no contraindication for the RAS, you can go ahead with the RAS um, and, uh, and start any of them. Uh, preferably, you should start with any, and uh, if uh, they are not eligible for any, you can uh, go uh, with uh, ACI or AROB. Any of such can be, re uh, can be taken before hospital discharge. Then 2022, uh, American Heart Association and the American uh, College of Cardiology uh, guidelines also, uh, uh, also put the, uh, the RAS, uh, that is the ANI, the ACI, and the AROB, they are all also in the front line of uh, cla um, uh, class A, sorry, uh, level A recommendation. Now, the paradigm heart failure, which is the landmark uh, study that brought in the issue of the um, of the uh, the ANI, uh, this trial was a uh, was a trial that brought the issue of ANI into um, uh, into landmark and uh, the guidelines start recommending it. It showed very clearly when uh, when the uh, and, um, the vas vas vasatan and uh, uh, Sarko Bitri, which is represented here by the SCZ696, uh, when it was tried against uh, Nanapri, it was clear that it was superior and the recommendation was that one is that the uh, it's, um, SCZ uh, reduce, reduce the risk of cardiovascular death and hospital um, uh, a heart failure hospitalization. It also reduced the risk of death by incremental of 20%. Uh, so re a reduction in hosp hospitalization was at 21%. And then all cost mortality incrementation was at, uh, uh, reduction was at 16%. Uh, uh, so it was immediately entered into uh, the guideline. You can see the various uh, uh, graphing uh, connotation here that tells us that when you use um, ACI, what, uh, what are you aiming to achieve? If you use um, uh, AROB, what are you aiming to achieve? And if you use um, uh, ANI, what are you aiming uh, to achieve? So if the patient can afford it, like in our environment, where uh, insurance will not, pay for, uh, will not pay for this drug, so if the patient can afford it, you can start with that. If patient can also tolerate it. If not, you can move to any other of the medication that the patient can uh, tolerate. So along the steps of the heart failure uh, management, as you progress down along the step, after as, as they see the patient can also be recommended for, um, for cardiac risk synchronization uh, uh, therapy. So the point here is that in hospital initiation of this therapy are important. That is the point here we want to make. Before the patient is discharged, when the patient comes with volume overload, uh, the first thing that we do for that patient in taking action is to ensure that that volume overload is, uh, is reduced. Then you also assess the comorbidity that are accompanying uh, that heart failure because the patient may not present with just only heart failure alone. There may also be renal failure. There may also have comorbidity, diabetes, hypertension, and the rest. These are the list of things that accumulate into the issue of heart failure. So it's to sort out and individualize each patient and find out. And when that is done, once that patient qualifies for each of these drugs, you, st you, you start at a lower dose and up titrate according to what the guideline recommend today. Even the, the pioneer heart failure also show that if you put patients on heart failure uh, with um, uh, ANI and those on enanapri, those on uh, ANI, they have a, 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 a much reduction faster with their BMP and pro-BMP. That is what that study showed. Then the impulse also tell us uh, the same thing, that starting this patient earlier is more beneficial, especially when the ejection fraction is less than 40 
uh, percent. Then we now came to the point uh, to the point of the medication enabling. How do you titrate this medication? For example, you practice in an environment where uh, there is no echocardiography in the emergency. That is, every patient that come to uh, that come to uh, to the emergency, the patient receive uh, echocardiography within uh, within 24 hours. Many uh, tertiary hospital across Nigeria don't have that capacity. So what you 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 teed up among these four pillars of drug is this. You have diagnosed this patient with heart failure, that this patient has a heart failure. What next should you do? If you want to initiate any of these disease modifying agent, you can start with, you can start with your, uh, with your, um, your uh, SGLT2 inhibitor uh, before you, you go ahead because SGLT2 inhibitor uh, as of today is across the board. Either half failure will reduce digestion fraction, mid range or preserve. You can use it at any of these points. So you can start with that while you optimize that patient. If the patient can tolerate it, that is one. For those that are diabetic, half failure with diabetic, uh, you, you can go as high as 25 uh, milligram daily. But for those that are just pure heart failure, 10 milligram is usually what the guideline recommend for us. So once your echo is done, you will be able to use your values of your echo ejection fraction to divide this patient into uh, mid range, uh, reduce and preserve ejection fraction, and you build up the medication. The point here, the key point is start at a lower dose and you keep up titrating as much as the patient uh, can tolerate. Then another issue here is that, remember when I was talking about the four pillars of uh, heart failure medication here, you have the beta blocker, you have the ANI, that is the RAS pathway, the beta blocker, the MRA, which, uh, which we have two medication there in Nigeria. Two of them are the, the spirolatone and the prerilon. Any of them can be used the reason why one is above the other is because some of uh, some people, especially men, you put them on spirolatone, they will have uh, breast tenderness and pain and gynecomastia. So in that, you can reverse it to a prerelon. The that side effect is not uh, common with a prerelon as compared to spirolatone. So these are the way you titrate the drugs. So the key thing is that start uh, for a beta blocker if they are still volume overload. Wait until you dry them uh, to a reasonable extent. When the volume overload has much reduced, you bring in your beta blocker. And also remember, even though some people argue that if they have asthma with heart failure, COPD with heart failure, with this beta blocker uh, be used. If at all you must use any of them, the key one that stands out among them is the bisoprolol for such group of people. So this is how you titrate and you move on with your uh, heart failure management. Then for those that we advance further because heart failure is something that is a chronic inflammatory disease that continue progressing. All that this medication do is to slow down uh, the rate of progression. Heart failure can be worse than many notable cancers that even trouble uh, people fear most compared to uh, uh, to heart failure. So if the heart failure keep progressing, the first thing you think of is this patient qualified for any of the device, then you start uh, evaluating them uh, for device. Don't waste time, evaluate them for device and add it to the therapy if need uh, occur. So now the, uh, how do we titrate this medication as I said, there are various considerations here as of today, if you look at the guidelines. Uh, some people, if you look at the conventional uh, sequencing, uh, before now, they will tell you, start with your uh, ACI, uh, ACI, then from ACI, when the, uh, the, volume over, uh, the volume overload has been reduced, you bring in your beta blocker and increase it, then bring in your uh, spirolatone or the prerilon, then you can also bring in, uh, if they cannot tolerate your ACI, you can bring in your ARB, then add your, your um, uh, that, uh, that big, sorry, add your 
dapaglyphosine, epiglyphosine, sotaglyphosine, which is the S, uh, SGL2 uh, inhibitors. But today, what we are not, uh, what we are not doing is what we call rapid sequencing. Rapid sequencing when the patient present and you start your uh, patient pre uh, presenting acute heart failure, volume overload. First thing is uh, ensure that that volume overload is reduced. Why doing that? Uh, initiate your your uh, SIGL2 inhibitor if they can tolerate it. And when the time comes, bring in your beta blocker, then you can either consider your ANI or your, uh, min uh, your mineral, uh, mineral cortical receptor antagonist and build it up. Uh, one of the reasons for uh, issue of the uh, SGL2 inhibitor is that it cut across board. And the more you synergize these medications, the better it is. For those that cannot afford, like what I do for uh, some of my patients, for those that cannot afford uh, uh, any, what do you do? You can bring in uh, uh, SGL2. SGL2, we have about four brands in, uh, in the country. You have uh, Jardian, one of them come in the name of Jardian, another one come in the name of Fosiga, another one come in the name of um, uh, Dabzin. Then you have the fourth one that called uh, Epijet. Uh, the prices are not the same. Some patients can afford uh, the cheaper one. You go to the market and find out which one is cheap among them. So, the, so go for the cheaper one. And they still have very effective means of addressing your issue for you. So you can start with that. Bring in your beta blocker. You have the bisoprolol. You have the metoprolol succinate. You also have um, your cave de law at a lower dose and titrate. Then you, when you get to Annie, yes, Annie, we have as, uh, only one you wish stands as Upero for now. Uh, we don't have another marketing brand here so far. If the patient cannot afford it, you can bring in your ARB or your, your ACI at a lower dose, then up titrate as much as the patient uh, can turn away. So the rapid sequencing is that uh, they want to then uh, defer. You, you can start with any, then you move on uh, with your beta blocker the, and continue up titrate. Then the key thing is that each of these drugs should be, that is a take-home point. They should be started at a lower dose. You can start your SGL2 inhibitor at five milligrams. You can start as low as that. So an of titrate, you must not start at 10 milligrams. When you hit the patient, the patient tells you that he can't tolerate it and you end up uh, going into other issues. So when do you look at these four pillars and they come in, the outcome of this patient is better. Uh, debt, uh, the overall debt among them is also reduced and overall cost of mortality reduced. Hospitalization is also reduced from the outcome trial that have been done so far. Looking at the pioneer study, looking at the, um, the uh, Copernicus, Ephesus, all these are studies that have shown us that when we do that, we get a better uh, response. Now, why is rapid titration and the use of four foundational therapy uh, important here? Is because of the trial that has been done here. We have the Paragon, uh, the uh, the Paragon half pilot trial. Then you also talk about uh, other the um, uh, the Pioneer, the um, uh, M plus uh, trial. These are all things that show that this patient gets better when you titrate them this way. So the aim is to bring them into the disease modifying. Uh, medication. So, induction of the therapy, as I said, where they are fully volume overload, don't start beta blocker at that point. And uh, just hold on, titrate with your uh, with your diuretics. Diuretics, you have fantastic diuretics so far in the country. You have uh, the tos uh, the uh, the tosemide, the fusemide, the pometamide. They are all available, both in uh, I think especially to uh, tosemide and fusemide, both in aura and uh, and uh, and IV uh, medication. So you can do that. Then you start bringing in your 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 disease modifying agent and up titrate them as the gold. Then it, it, it need may also come that you may, they may also require evabradine 
if they can one, they cannot tolerate beta blocker, or you have gone to the highest dose of that beta blocker and you still need to further reduce their heart rate, then you can bring that bring that in. The Jozine, if they are uh, there is heart failure with AF, yes, you have indication for that. Heart failure will reduce the ejection fraction, we also use it. Then also uh, heart failure um, uh, with tachycardias, you also use it, but mindful of the side effect and the toxicity of the, the jocines and all the things that surrounds it. Then the varicigua, the same thing, you can also bring it in. Then as the patient titrate goes this way, then start planning your device uh, therapy. Device therapy, if they are not qualified, if they are qualified for a CROT, obviously there are reasons to qualify. A gesture fraction should be less than. First thing about the CROT is that uh, are they? Are you going to do upgrading for them? That is one thing. If this upgrading patient has an ICD before, and the patient need to be upgraded now, that is your value for CROT. Patient had a pacemaker before, I need that to be upgraded now. You have value for CROT. Patient is sinus reading, de novo, heart failure has been on medication, optimal dose medication has it can turn away from the guideline, but still deteriorating, and the patient need a CROT evaluate ejection fraction has to be less than 35 then the qrs complex is it uh, lbb pattern or non lbb pattern non lbb pattern can present in various form the key things that we usually see in nigeria in non lbb pattern is robb and uh, intraventricular conduction delay that you cannot uh, specifically cl uh, classify as lbb you can also push that as non LBB. For LBB, patient has to have patient has to have a QRS complex that is above uh, 150, that is class one, or 130 to uh, 149, that is uh, uh, class two A. Then for uh, for those that are non LBB, the QRS complex has to be uh, above 150, that is class two. A, that is, if it is 130 to 149, that is uh, 2B. So any of them that qualify for D, if there is a need to uh, add on a defibrillation, then fine. But for frail elderly, chronic kidney disease, and will require a lot of di uh, diuresis, you may teeth or cachexia, and you may not have enough space for a very huge uh, 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 battery. These are, as I said, the patient always individualized. So these are reasons where you can argue for a CROTP. If not, the patient require, uh, 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 require a defibrillation in the course of the heart failure, then it's better you can go for uh, a, C, uh, a CROTD. Okay, so. This, the aim of all this therapy is to modify your, uh, to modify the, uh, the part of uh, physio uh, physiology of heart failure. Then for, as you said, for those that are at risk, uh, we heard of a case, uh, let me just share that case here. We heard of a case that um, um, a patient with hokum, very bad uh, taking a, ventri a left ventricle, patient went for, uh, for an uh, for an ICD, the aim of that ICD is to protect that patient from ladder arrhythmia like ventricular fibrillation or ventricular tachycardia that may kill them uh, very fast. That is the aim of the ICD. And most time, if there is no indication for pacing, you go just go ahead and put your single chamber ICD for them. Now. That ICD is not aimed to stop the hokum from progressing down along the line. It doesn't do that. So despite the hokum, you will still put that, those group of people for their medication. But when you get a bad hokum that way, first thing you do is to classify them. Are they obstructive or non-obstructive? For the non-obstructive, what the guideline says is that start with varapami if they can tolerate it. For the obstructive, you can start with beta blocker, then add on uh, varapami if the need is available. But a patient who has a heart failure and uh, with reduced digestion fraction, and it comes down with uh, ventricular fibrillation and uh, survive it, 
and that patient is not qualified for a CRT, you can go ahead and put an ICD for secondary uh, prevention. And you can also use that, uh, use an ICD for primary prevention, depend is in ischemia, ischemia class one, non-ischemia class two A uh, recommendation. So an ICD, yes, it decreases mortality because of the arrhythmia associated with this group of people, not that it reduces the progression of that particular disease, is the arrhythmia. And another thing, again, the ICD comes in, you must educate your patient to keep on with their medication, because if the ICD keeps shocking every second, it has a worse prognosis for that patient. Maybe AJ will talk about it later on. So this is a patient with another one with ventricular tachycardia, also in heart failure with reduced digestion fraction, either ICD or a CRT may be evaluated in this group of people. Okay, so the reason for the CRT is because of the desynchrony. That is the key thing about CRT. The desynchrony is the main reason why we go for the CRT. Now, why is it desynchrony? There are various type of it. You have um, uh, <clears throat> uh, atrial ventricular desynchrony. Then you also have atrial, atrial desynchrony. You also have uh, interventricular desynchrony. Then you also have in, uh, 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 intraventricular desynchrony. So the aim of ICD is to sort out uh, interventricular and intraventricular uh, desynchrony. So this is why an ICD comes in, sorry, um, a CROT comes in for this group of patients. So the aim is to unravel, sorry, to resolve the issue of desynchrony one side of the heart, start uh, um, uh, contraction and the other side is waiting and the, sec the other side start contraction and the side that started contracting has, uh, has come into a uh, relaxation. So the aim is to resolve all this in uh, people with um, a CRO, uh, CROT. Okay, so these are the clinical trial, won't take time to talk about them, the key pillar studies that uh, that talks about uh, CRT that brought them in. So CRT has a number of benefits. Uh, I've seen a number of patients in my in my follow up with them that we have had fantastic uh, super response among them. We have also had uh, response among them. We, are, we have also had no response. Yes, but this, uh, uh, the the response far outweigh a uh, super response and far, far, far at way, no response. Very few no response. Maybe you do from my, my, my I, there's a paper I, I, I sent out for uh, publications, the super, res, uh, super response, quite very good among us here. And also female does better than males among, I, among CROT. Uh, and also if you check studies all over uh, the world, it's still the same thing. And it's still the same thing we're also replicating here. Females does better than male. I don't know the reason. If we know, we can profile the reason to us. Is it because of the male hormone? Is it because of the female hormone? Who knows? Then uh, the clinical uh, uh, response, echocardiographic response, in the digestion fraction as of today is 40. From nine, sorry, from 19 to 40, that is a dramatic, excellent work for that young man. When I was discussing with Tipley, I was shocked. I was telling him that where I wasn't with him, the cardiologists at the center where he came from were so excited with what that young man has approved. And that is a, that is a game changer for him. And many other patients that we are doing the same thing. The case we did yesterday where we asked AJ to help us in identifying where each of those lead because we are using a biotronic lead bringing it to a metronic, uh, a metronic battery. So we got to a point where the metronic battery, the instruction there, if you follow that instruction, the biotronic uh, lead was not entering. I have to call AJ because if I, opt, if I do something different, I have, I have to take that patient back and open that patient up again, which no operator wanted. So I have to seek for uh, and second opinion, and he bailed us out. Thank you very much for that. So clinical response uh, also is noted among them. This was the case of yesterday. Uh, if you can see my marker here, this is where we enter. A very beautiful, 
posterolateral vein. And the patient, excellent, respond very good. Ah, I don't know why it's not playing because I loaded it as video. Uh, well, it's not playing, but I think it's video, but uh, yeah, I've seen it. I've seen where it's supposed to play from. Yeah, this is a beautiful posterolateral vein. And that is where we enter. Uh, yeah. I loaded it, but it looks like it's not playing. So you can see, you can see that the predators of CRT respond. LBB is a, a good marker. Then QRS complex is also very critical. It has to be wide for you to get the um, uh, the response. Then the uh, non-ischemic are also better than ischemic. Women are also uh, uh, respond better than men. So. Other therapies that you can also see in heart failure, let's just glance through them in a the, uh, few seconds. Uh, there are a number of them, especially when you come to the IABPM, you may need that for uh, a heart failure that has coronary um, uh, acute MI. We, we have IABPM in Nigeria here and we make use of it for those that come down with um, a massive MI with uh, cardiogenic shock and you want to take that case we can do that then. Uh, Ipela, Ipela uh, 2.5, Ipela 3, Ipela 5. They are all, uh, those Ipela is not available in Nigeria, but they are all part of what uh, we use there. The heart mate also part of what we use here. So this is the IABPM. There are two ways to, uh, uh, to implant the IABPM. Uh, AJ, that, let me just describe it for my audience here in the country. Uh, the first thing where you want to implant your IABPM is look at the uh, look at this vessel here. That is the left subclavian artery. That left subclavian artery, the tip of the IABPM should be at that point. And immediately after the left subclavian artery, the um, the aortic ash end, and you, you the uh, the aorta continue as a descending thoracic aorta. So that is where you position the IABPM. Now, another thing, another key thing that you also, if you don't have a way to measure where, the, where it is, is that um, clinically, you can locate the angle of Lewis. You can locate the angle of Lewis, just look at the Manibrostena junction, which is the angle of Lewis, and it's at T2 then you measure from the groin where you take your puncture, you measure the length that we take, that we take that, <clears throat> that we take that, the, uh, that we take the IAB uh, BPM pump that we take in. So you put in that length. If you do that, you almost arrive at the same point. That is for those that cannot assess uh, the subclavian uh, artery or measure it by taking uh, an angel. That is another way to uh, to look uh, to look at it. For example, <clears throat> you want to if you want to push in IABPM in the ICU without taking the patient to theater. That is the way to get it done. So you just measure it, get the patient sterile because you can't bring uh, a floral machine into the uh, into the uh, into the ICU or the coronary care unit. So just measure it and take that length and you implant it. I remember what we did a lot when I was, uh, when I was still training in, uh, uh, in India, then you set it up. Then we have talked about the left ventricular assist device, which are not available here, wherever they are available. If uh, your devices, that is your uh, CROT phase, these are the things you now go into. They can be used as a bridge to therapy. They can also be used 
as a destination therapy if heart failure is uh, is progressing and the patient don't have a means of getting into transplantation then just a, sip, a few words for the heart failure will preserve ejection fraction heart failure will preserve ejection fraction the key thing in the management of heart failure will preserve ejection fraction is to uh, is to look at the etiology and address the etiology having addressed the etiology there are drugs that can also work here as we said diuretics you use it across board <clears throat> then two uh, sga2 inhibitors you use them across board so if a patient will have failure we preserve ejection fraction that is the first drug you would think of so it's class 2a uh, recommendation so when it gets to class 2a recommendation i'm sure in the next two years it will uh, it will move into class 1a recommendation then a small trial comes in. Then for Annie, Annie has come in as, uh, uh, if you look at the, um, the uh, para, uh, Paragon half, uh, uh, half a lot, uh, trial, uh, the results uh, uh, narrowly miss statistical value. So, but when they did the sub-analysis, they found out that women do, uh, women, uh, women did better with that medication than men. And it was uh, it was statistically significant for women. So today, as it stands, if a patient has heart failure, we preserve ejection fraction. And uh, the uh, is a woman, you can use it across board as a class two B uh, recommendation. Then, if it is um, a man, if it is ejection fraction is less than sixty, you can also use it among among then the. Uh, MROA then uh, is also class two uh, B then AR, uh, uh, AROB or ANI you can also bring it in but the key thing is here management of the uh, 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 of the etiology then exercise for this group of people even people with heart failure with a digestion fraction as much as they can tolerate also advise them to uh, if it is even walking trekking. They, if they can do that as much, also advise them. Then for half a we preserve ejection fraction is part of the reading. Then you bring in your SGL2. Then we talk about those that have um, ejection fraction between 50 to 60. You can bring in your ANI or AROB or ACI. Then also 50 to 60, you can also bring in your AR, uh, your mineral cortical. Then for those that if they are women, you can bring it across board. Okay, so the Paragon heart failure, I've talked about it, a narrowly misstatistic, most more trials are still coming. Uh, I think uh, these are the few things I would like to say before we now conclude it by saying that the management of heart failure is involving. And despite all the medication, the devices and various uh, um, ways to manage it, it is still a disease that troubles physicians both day and night. And if we titrate the medication and as individualized, we may get more results. And for those that will require, uh, that will require devices, don't withhold them from having their devices. And the presence of a CROT or ICD does not stop them from their medication. It's an add-on therapy to them. Doing this, we may prolong their life. Thank you very much. Oh, that was fantastic. Yeah. Thank you very much for that, Dr. Dafe. Yeah, you thank you. Do we have any questions from the group on all of that? We, I know we covered a lot of information there. Okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Doctor. Thank you. Yeah, Francis, how are you? I'm fine. Good, 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 good. Go ahead. Fantastic lecture. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Thank you. Perfect. Well, I, I don't think we have any questions. I think that was really, that was great content. There have to be uh, questions on AJ because this is heart failure. I, I'd love some. I mean, um, not much I can contribute aside from the device part. 
so it, it is my understanding you said there's no um, access to LVAD yet, obviously. Um, so balloon pumps as well? Is there? No, balloon? we have balloon pump. We have okay. balloon pump in Nigeria. Oh, but we don't have Ipela. We don't have AVAD. We don't okay. have that yet. Yes. And, and we have not started doing transplantation yet. Hmm. We have not got into transplantation. Our okay. transplantation is still not yet. Okay. Yeah, we, we have, um, you know, I, I have some friends that work for, uh, that did work for Impella. We should talk to them. But with LVAD, one thing to remember too is it's a permanent solution, right? So if you get an LVAD, they core out a part of your left ventricle and you're pretty much stuck with that until you either get a transplant or the rest of your life with battery packs and a holster around. Yes. You. Things to keep in mind for that is that it's not even a, it's not even a temporary solution. You're, you're stuck with it. Correct. Any uh, questions? Uh, please, please, Dr. Idafe, please, where, where can we get IABP machine, uh, intraiotic balloon pump in Nigeria? IAB, no, we have it in, uh, in cardio care. It's usually attached to the cat lab. Okay, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, I can hear you. We have it there. I'm sure F FCC also have it. And um, I remember because I've also operated in, um, uh, in uh, uh, this place, uh, what do you call it again? I've operated also in, um, uh, in uh, uh, this, um, uh, I think, what do you call it? Too? Uh, that is uh, Shagamo. What is the name of that hospital again? I've operated there. They also have it. Uh, I'm sure, uh, Doctor La, do you have uh, do you have IABPM in your center? Is it Babcock? Yes, I've operated in Babcock. They have it. Okay, then also, we also um, okay, yeah, you we have. also have in Enugu. Um, oh, you have your fine, fine. Yeah, yeah sure, sure. We need uh, to support uh, our open heart patients as well. Maybe. Yes. You are right. Yeah. You are right. So, AJ, that is the place I'm. I'm. Uh, I'm going to ending of this week. Um, AJ, you, you muted yourself. Mute yourself, AJ. There well, we go. You muted yourself. yourself. I wanted to. <laughs> to. I just wanted to add something. So, thank you very much for this. Um, you know, great review of heart failure therapy. I just wanted to also mention that really, you know, the, the ultimate goal with heart failure, yes, we have devices that can help. And yes, we have all of these things that can help once the patient has heart failure, but the emphasis should always be put on early diagnosis and you know, recognition of these patients with heart failure, because you'd be surprised how much very simple things can do to prevent a patient from having to get to, you know, progressing. the very progressive ranges of heart failure. So um, there are a lot of patients who will end up in very severe heart failure because they have either uncontrolled high blood pressure or because they have coronary disease as a result of diabetes and things that are easily, well, not easily, but they could have been predicted. And so if we can catch these patients really early, then we can um, prevent them from having to need all these um, very invasive you know, therapies for later. So your patients with high blood pressure, very important to control their blood pressure or blood pressure hypertension management earlier on for sure. Um, and um, any patients who come in with complaints of shortness of breath, if they can get an echocardiogram, that would be great um, just to make sure that they don't have heart failure so that you can start off with this medical management first. And sometimes you might be, if you catch them early enough in their course, then you can reverse this like um, the patients that you've mentioned. Very correct, Dr. Joma. Thank you very much for the wonderful uh, comment. Uh, the issue with the country is this. You know our patient, they come late. That is one. Because the reason is this, the, the, the head-seeking behavior of our environment needs to be worked on. And another issue, there are things that affect this. 
Uh, religion is one of the big thing. Culture is another thing. Belief system is another thing. And also funding is another thing. There are barrage of things. In fact, if we start talking about uh, barriers to management of heart failure in Nigeria, you'll be shocked of what we are going to mention. So this is how it is. Uh, where you have this system work, the, your primary level of uh, healthcare system has to be effective. Your secondary level of healthcare system has to be effective. Then your tertiary also have to be effective across boards. So it's good we mention these things. So we are not going into them because if you go into them, it is another wall of its own. So at the end, most of the people that we come to you are those that end up at the terminal end. Before they even get to you, they must have visited A, B, C, D, which you cannot even count. So these are the issues. So as you said, education keep going and keep going, but we need more and we need every stakeholder, the government, the non-government, individuals, everybody has to be responsible. Thank you. I mean, the good thing, well, I don't know if this is necessarily a good thing, but the issues mm. that I'm um, talking about, it doesn't, it's also the same issues. I'm in Houston, and it's also the same issues in places that do not have a lot of healthcare literacy. So the same thing I'm telling you is also the same thing that I tell my patients as well. Um, you know, Oops. there's certain things that um, education has helped and public health um, this is where the our public health colleagues help us with, right? So like the recognition of symptoms of an MI or the recognition of symptoms for stroke, that has been as a result of, you know, very determined public health um, pioneers who have gone around um, spreading the word about these two conditions all over the country. And so now people recognize that. And, you know, um, probably in a few months we're, about to do something with um, cardiac arrest so that people understand that as well. But it's Excellent. not, and if it is so, so think, think about it this way, right? So if in United States, which is supposed to be like someplace that is very, um, you know, technologically advanced, if we're still having the same issues here, you know, then of course we'll, um, you know, we're still having the same issues in places that are not as technically advanced. And, you know, um, the focus, you know, is us also knowing where to put our focus, which is, you know, education. And so if we can um, have folks um, lobby our um, government, like you mentioned, the government and everything and put um, money not only into the things that need a great deal of capital, but also into things that might not need as much capital which is the you know public health education and um, investment into primary care, then that would definitely help our health in the future. Yeah, thank you very much, correct. Uh, to that end, I think that um, Dr. Aseko and CardioCare, they, they have some interesting ways of leveraging social media as well. Well, obviously, you know, government, um, it, work in this and public health work is important. I think it's good for institutions as well to reach out to communities using social media because it's free in many cases and it allows you to reach an audience and inform people about their health. And, uh, you know, I, I think that's also a way to consider uh, being progressive in these cases. Good. Just a comment. This is Dr. Mbadi. I, I want to say that uh, in, term, in terms of uh, creating awareness, education of the people, um, right over here in the country, we use times like uh, when we have um, World Health, uh, um, I mean, uh, World Hypertension Days, which has just recently passed. We usually advise every institution, you know, members in the Nigerian Cardiac Society, we usually you know, ask people to cover their own area. For instance, down here in the East, we did a lot of radio station, um, you know, talks, engage many stations who will give talks at different times. I know that this is not enough because people who are uh, offering alternative 
effective medicine are in the markets, on the roads, in the streets, bombarding the people with wrong information, giving them all sorts of things that are preventing them from reaching the hospital where they can get the right care. So I believe that if we get people, um, it can be volunteer work from us at any opportunity. Also, when we see our patients who have hypertension, we can tell them to tell their relations to also seek to know whether they have hypertension because early treatment, like Dr. Ijama said, is actually the, that, that is the cheapest treatment. These devices are good, but how many people can afford it? Even now that, you know, um, Pace for Life is helping and other um, uh, organizations are helping to see how, but still how many people are able to benefit from it? So I think that education of the people is also very important at any level. When we go from uh, village activities, meetings from our, for our people from our places, I think we might be slotting it in. Who knows how many people can get the information and it may be uh, something that they also can pass on to prevent. So right like Dr. Joma said, education is very, very important. The more people get to know about HIV and other things that can cause heart failure and some of these things are preventable, some of these things are treatable, then we may not have so many people going to the terminal stage where they will need these devices, which are uh, very, very expensive. Okay, in as much as we are grateful that now these devices are available and you know we're having them getting implanted now, but like you say, only few people are still benefiting. So that's I think education we have to emphasize on it. Thank you. Those are very good points. Yeah, thank you for that. Any uh, anyone else want to uh, speak while we're still on the subject before we change gears here? Okay. Uh, well, I'll go ahead and jump into this. I, I know we've taken up enough of your uh, Sunday evening, so I don't want to take too much time here, but uh, we had an interesting case study that Dr. Dafe referenced earlier. Um, and then I just want to go over a general review of different lead types, specifically pins and ports. We've had this talk before, and I'm sure we can probably cover it again later, but I think it's always good to kind of keep these salient in your mind, because a lot of times, as been mentioned, you're going to have multiple sources of devices. You're going to have um, devices from different companies, different models, things like that. And it's good to, um, to keep track of what you have in your inventory and see how they can all be utilized for a patient. So let me move on here. Um, so just to begin with, and feel free to hop in if you have any questions. If anyone wants to reach out in the chat, I can't actually see it. So just let me know if there's any questions in the chat that I can address. But um, jumping in, bipolar versus unipolar leads. So your traditional leads were unipolar, and that still is a capability with modern bipolar leads for the most part. It's rare you'll see unipolar leads, but there are some instances of it, um, sometimes like epicardial leads, for example. But for unipolar, your cathode, for any time you have a circuit, you'll have a cathode and an anode, and your electrons are going to be flowing from your cathode to your anode to complete the circuit. So when you use these leads, you're just extending the loop of the circuit out. Your cathode will be the tip of the lead in a unipolar, and then it's going to be flowing to the anode. So in this case, it'll be flowing to the can, which closes the electrical circuit. Electricity is always looking to find balance. So closing the circuit is how it finds that balance. Bipolar, you're actually having your anode here at the ring. So you have a smaller electrical field where the electrons are flowing to, to complete the circuit. So they're leaving the, uh, the cathode tip and flowing to the anode. You can have instances where you'll have anodal capture. We've kind of talked about this in the past with anodal stimulation. Um, you can see it in a smaller bipole. You can also see it in pectoral stimulation in a patient programmed unipolar. So sometimes you'll have a patient programmed at high output or they'll have an auto capture algorithm running that runs at a high output and you'll see the patient's chest twitching rhythmically. That generally is a strong indicator that you have anodal stimulation or pocket stimulation. So things to keep in mind, these are just the simple makeups, makeup of the device. Remember, it takes a certain amount of electrical energy to stimulate the heart um, at the local level, and that causes the cascading effect across the heart. So moving along, just a zoomed in picture here. Here is an active fixation lead. Uh, this looks like it's a, um, a, a helix. Well, this is a helix, a helix fixation um, kind of looks like a corkscrew, but some are retractable, some are fixed. 
I'm not 100% sure, but this looks like a retractable helix, I would say. Um, so for a retractable, you make contact with the tissue and then you um, extend the helix. For a fixed, some of them have a uh, what's called a sweet tip. It's like a polysaccharide or sugar, I believe, insulation on it that, that dissolves over time and exposes the helix. Uh, some just have an exposed helix. But keep that in mind if you have a fixed um, screw out that that can uh, cause trauma to the tissue. So that's why the retractable are the, are the modern day standard. So you have your helix, it's electrically active, and then you have your ring electrode. That if you look at the passive fixation, you don't see these as much anymore, but uh, we did use one with uh, Dr. Dafe um, back at the beginning of the month. Um, you'll see here this kind of porous tip. This helps with polarization at the uh, at the tip of the lead. And then you have your ring electrode here. These tines are used to catch the tuberculation that's in the right ventricle and in the, um, in the um, uh, atria in the appendage. So it can just help with that process there. Moving along, IS-1 is your standard pacing lead, um, just the industry standard. Uh, so anytime you see an IS-1, it's going to fit the majority of pacing systems out there. So um, you have your IS-1 lead, you have your tip here. So remember the tip will correlate to the tip of the lead. The ring here will correlate to the ring of the lead. Um, you have these sealing rings here. That's just keeps any kind of uh, fluid from getting inside of the header at all. And then you see here where the ring and the tip make contact. And then remember when you're putting a lead into the header to always make sure that the uh, the tip extends past where it makes contact. That's just a good indicator that it's fully seated. If it's not properly seated, you may not be able to capture um, or it could cause noise or anything down the road. So just make sure that it's all the way in. Um, you screw the hex wrench tight and then uh, give it a little tug test to make sure there's no slippage in there. Then we have the um, DF1 and DF4 leads. So DF1 are the defibrillation leads. Um, they were the first to come out. DF4 was a later iteration. For a DF1, you have a trification at this yoke right here. You have a, a sense and pace lead, and then you'll have a RV coil and possibly an SVC coil. So there may be occasions that you'll just see two of these at the yoke. That just means there's no SVC coil. It's a single coil. Um, single coil defibrillation lead. With the modern DF4, this is the standard you see a lot more often nowadays, everything is just integrated onto one lead. So you have your sense um, pace tip here, this will be your ring, and then your two high voltage RV coil, SVC coil, and that's labeled appropriately. So low voltage, low voltage, high voltage, high voltage. So once again, this one will correlate to your uh, sense pace, and then these two will correlate to the um, high voltage leads accordingly. Just to remember, or just to see how they kind of seat here, you're making your contact with your electrodes. Um, and then here's your standard IF1, DF1, everything has just been kind of separated out. So an important thing to distinguish between is an IF, IS4 and DF4 lead. So remember that your IS4 is for pacing. This is gonna be for your quad or LV leads everything on this circuit is low voltage. So it cannot sustain any high voltage outputs. Problem is they look very similar to DF4 leads to the naked eye. So they've made the IS4 lead to have a larger tip here and the DF4 to have a smaller tip here. The reason they do this is so you cannot put the pin of the IS4 all the way into a DF4. It won't properly seat. That way, if you're in a hurry, you're not paying attention, and you accidentally put the IS-4 into the port and lock it down, you won't be able to properly connect, and you won't accidentally try to give patient therapy through their low-voltage lead, which won't work because there's not enough surface area on those electrodes to really um, give any kind of energy. Um, and as a result, the patient could be in, a, in bad shape. So they've ingeniously just had this simple solution of an IS-4 just won't fit inside of a DF-4. However, a DF4 will fit inside of an IS4. And there's been some instances of it. I just cited this one. You're probably never going to do this in your entire life. But there's been instances of actually downgrading a patient and using the um, DF4 into the IS4 port to allow um, the patient to go from a defibrillator to a biventricular pacemaker. I just thought it's kind of interesting. So I included that. 
And then here's just an image about how the contacts work with these, um, each separated by these little ceiling rings to keep any kind of fluid um, from reaching and maybe short circuiting the connection here. Any questions so far? Okay. Um, yeah, so, AJ. Yes, AJ. Sir. Yeah, when when you have a DF1 lead mm -hmm. and it trifurcates, the uh, the middle, yeah, correct. That middle uh, port is where your stylet goes through. Correct. Yep. Yeah. Exactly. That's where the stylet goes through. Yeah. If you mistakenly put a stylet in the outer ports, it doesn't go through it to the end. The stylet may go to a point and hang, but the stylet goes down freely on the middle. So obviously, um, from Medtronic, from St. Jude, from Biotronic, or any other company, if you have this, the middle is always the pacing port. Am I correct? I don't think you should use that rule, though. I think you should just read the whatever is on the label. That's better. No, no. Wait, wait I'm coming. Wait, I'm coming. Dr. No, the reason why I'm saying, no, the reason why I say this is because depending on the company, you can't really predict what is going to happen. So if you know what I'm saying, can I land on... with my, can I land with my comments? Okay. Why I am asking is this, I have checked because here we do use Medtronic and now we are adding St. Jude to Medtronic. When I check this, that's the stylet, the one that the stylet usually go to is the middle, and it is always written IS1. And that is where the stylet goes through. And if you check it with the battery, because the one the battery we have is the battery we have um a, a round sign with a dot on it. Why the other, we have a round sign without a dot on it. Mm. I've checked both St. Jude and both Medtronic. So I want you to explain that. So Dr. Jama, you can go ahead. Oh, well, I guess what I was just trying to say was that instead of saying, oh, the middle one is always the one with the stylet or trying to say, to give absolutes to the location, what I was saying was, hey, if you see one that says, you know, I guess one, then that's going to be, if you have a DF1 lead, then that is the one that goes into the pacing port. And so if you just make your rule as, because even me with as many devices as I place, I still call out the lead numbers, like when I'm putting things in. So if I Correct. say, like I say, okay, I'm looking at the DF1 and then I'll confirm on the can and I will say, and the good thing now is that all the cans, when they put in the labels, when you have a multi header, they will tell you what goes into what. And they won't only do it according to the symbol, they'll also do it with words. So they'll have SVC, they'll have um, you know, RV, and then they'll have the um, IS1, like basically pacing and the RA and all of that. So I will say, oh, you know, the DF1 is in the, um, you know, is in the right upper and this one is in the right lower. Like I will still confirm. Mm. And the device representative will have the box with them and they will confirm it with me just so that, you know, you're not taking anything for granted. So I was, my point was that even, even if you know that it's in the middle, you still want to check, double check, triple check with the words that are written on the cable, on the lead itself, so that you don't Very end correct. up putting something where it's not supposed to be. Yeah. yeah. So that is your mind. The point is that, the point you are making is that multiple check is what we should do. Even though you know it is, you suggest that it is this. Always read out the value, what is written on that particular plug. 
before you go ahead and put it. Yeah. I think, yeah, that's a, that's a really good point, um, Dr. Joma. And one thing to reference too, is if this is only a uh, single coil lead, it's not going to be the middle, right? It's going to be, um, I mean, it may, but you're not going to have this third here. So it's going to be a little more confusing. I, I don't know of another manufacturer where you would ever put a stylet down the high voltage lead to your point, uh, Dr. Dafe, but just in case, I, as she's, as Dr. Uh, Dr. Caro said, reference, reference the box here, but as you can see, it's a straight shot for that lumen and it'll go all the way down. Um, and then this one right here is me is measured. I can't really see it, but it's marked DF1 RV, DF1 um, RV or IVC, SVC, sorry. Uh, one thing, oh yeah, that's what I was going to say. Um, Dr. Carroll, when you're talking about the box, so for reprocess devices, they're no longer in the box. So for anyone who is using any kind of reprocess devices, strong recommendation to look that one up ahead of time. There is a, an app on your phone called like iPacemaker Plus, which is not the cheapest in the world, but it, it has every resource for every lead and device out there that I've come across. Um, or you can just Google it online, but I would always look up that model number and find out what the header pattern looks like. It's available for all the manufacturers. And that way, um, if you're, you know, the cardiac physiologist, you can be ready. And I don't know if you can see my screen, but I like to draw out ahead of time, you know, what the pattern is. So I know the layout. So I just draw that out. And that way, when they're trying to put everything in and, you know, they're you don't have the glasses on or what have you, you can be on standby to tell them where everything is located. Yes, correct. AJ, then I also add, apart from checking, then when you bring up that reprocess device on the body of that can, there is a diagram written there. That is the final pathway to check. So you must also check that too. Yeah, absolutely. Perfect. So one of the things we ran into with our trip in June, uh, oops, we didn't have uh, port plugs or caps. Uh, part of they just we have them in in the country, but they were just separated from us. So I would always recommend keeping these on the shelf. Different port plugs will go uh, for different ports. Sometimes I think you could maybe make some work, but I'm I'm not experienced in that. Maybe um, Dr. Kuro, you'll know, but we actually had to sacrifice some LV leads to. Uh, to plug IS1 ports. So we we sacrificed IS1 leads just to plug a port. So we didn't have any kind of um, you know exposure of the header. Same thing with caps. You can technically cut the lead and stretch the insulation and tie it off with a suture. It's always better just to put a cap on it. So I would recommend keeping these on hand. And then obviously hex wrenches, um, always keep some extra hex wrenches ready to go. Reprocessed devices will not have hex wrenches waiting for you. So if you don't have one, you're going to have a can and no way to connect it. So uh, recommend always having these. I don't have it listed, but always recommend having suture sleeves and medical adhesive as well. It is a great way to make a makeshift um, lead repair kit. So if you're doing a generator change and there's damage to the lead or you inadvertently nick the insulation, you can actually put glue around it, put the suture sleeve around it, and then tie it down with sutures. Um, it, it's this, this is not a me medical recommendation, but it, I have seen it function, I guess, is what I can tell you. All right. Uh, this is just to kind of reiterate what you're looking at when you put the... Um, put a lead into the header, you're looking for the extension, um, and you're actually looking for this under x-ray to make sure that it extends past where the set screw tightens down so you have good connectivity. So I just think it's it's good to always remember that because it could look like the lead is seated, but it may not be properly seated. Numbers could check out all right, but then you'll find out later that there's noise or thresholds are elevated. Um, you know, there's lots of instances where you put the lead in and there's lots of noise, you pull it out and there's some heme on there too that can affect your uh, your connection to the uh, to the electrodes. Because remember, it's a metal circuit. And if you have anything that's blocking that metal to metal contact, you're not gonna have a, a good connection. So jumping into this case study. So this is an interesting one. Um, you, all, you almost, uh, tripped me up there when you when you called me because you uh, Dr. Dafe because you said oh we have a we have a DF1 lead with two IS1s and I'm like yeah no that that's not something that occurs uh, I forgot that these existed until you sent me the Biotronic um, label so this is the label from the lead itself 
Um, as you can see, we went ahead and labeled this DF1 um, single coil SC. I recommend just doing this um, maybe next time for the Biotronic also put VDD. Um, I should have done this because this is obviously my handwriting, but I recommend putting in big numbers um, what they are because it can be kind of confusing looking at this. Uh, it doesn't really just tell you off the bat. So I like to just write out in clear terms what this is. So you may come across these. There's at least one more on the shelf, either at CardioCare or PortaCore, and you may see them in the wild. Um, but what this VDD lead does is it actually has a, um, your sense, your pace, your RV coil, and then another sensing um, electrode, sensing just circuit here, but no ability to pace that will sit in the right atrium. So these will either rest in the right atrium or kind of just be in the blood pool. But the idea is that you can track a um, signal in the right atrium, plug this into a dual chamber can or CRT can if you need. Um, and reduce the need to put an atrial lead into a patient that you're worried about occlusion and you're not concerned about them having um, a need for atrial pacing down the road. So you'll still be able to maintain your atrial synchrony conceivably. I, I haven't read the data on this, but uh, I'm sure a biotronic rep can give us all that, that details there. But you'll still be able to maintain your atrial synchrony, track what's happening in the atrium, but uh, you just won't be able to pace. So this just reduces the uh, the amount of um, the risk of occlusion down the road. It doesn't do a lot for pocket bulk, as you can see, but it at least it reduces the amount of um, leads you're putting into the vasculature. So moving along, here is one of these in action. I just found a picture online. So you see your scent, your tip, your uh, ring, your coil for the RV. And then this will actually just sit in the atrium and this allows for atrial sensing. Um, just a side by side, here is one, a passive fixation, tip, ring, coil, and then those two atrial electrodes right there. And then you can see the trification from the yoke. Uh, looks like a bifurcation, but I think that's three. Is this, um, was this placement like through a persistent left SVC or something? You it know, weird. it does look weird. Um, I <laughs> pulled this offline maybe an hour ago. So, uh, okay. <laughs> so I, I don't have all the details. It does look weird. Yeah. It looks like a persistent lack, but okay, cool. It looks nice. I, if I come across it online, I'll, I'll send you the case study from it. But yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. It does look interesting. Um, okay. So, Dr. Daffe, this may look familiar. I just made a digital copy of the diagram I wrote out for you yesterday. Here is the box that uh, Dr. Uh, Kuro had we just talked about, um, but uh, it's a little hard to read that says SVC. So you have, and yeah, this is the dot that Dr. Daffe was talking about for the low voltage leads. So circle yeah. with a dot in the middle. You know, I haven't looked close enough at our own boxes to tell you. I think you're right, but I'll have to take a look. Um, the uh, with the circle with the dot to indicate low voltage and then the uh, open circles to in indicate high voltage. But you have your RA, your RV, yes. your L SBT and RV. So I went ahead and drew this out just so you can all see. You can see this is a brilliant diagram of the human heart. <laughs> but for simplicity's sake, you have your right atrium, right ventricle and uh, left ventricle. This lead is actually obviously going through the CS, as you can tell from the brilliant uh, drawing and then going through a through a vein here. So just for clarity's sake, this would be the lead we're talking about. This with the uh, two with the two low voltage leads. You have your sense, your pace, you have your RV coil, and then you have your atrial sensing uh, electrodes here. It comes out to a yoke. So you would run your RV um, sense pace into the RV port. You would run your DF1 into the DF1 port. And then finally, you would just cap your RA sense pace. The reason why that this wasn't used in this case is, you know, the patient is going to be on medication. They will probably require some degree of atrial pacing down the road. So the, the lead was utilized um, just because it was on the shelf and that's what they had available. But for future reference too, if you have other leads to use, I would retain this and maybe try and use it for a patient that could use some degree of pacing with atrial synchrony. So if they're not a permanent AFib patient that you think may occasionally pace, I think you could make the argument to do that with a dual chamber device. Um, obviously, for the single chamber, you're going to have to cap this either way. So this one would be capped. 
you run your RA to your RA lead, and then finally your LV to your LV lead. And then up here in this top corner, the SVC coil, this lead does not have an SVC coil. So it would simply be plugged, that port right there. Uh, always make sure that you plug your DF1 lead for the RV into the RV slot. If you put it in the SVC slot, then your vector is going to be from here to here, which is going to be pretty much useless. Well, sorry, from here to here, which is going to be pretty useless for um, all of your um for your left and right ventricle, and it probably won't be able to defibrillate much at all. It may break up uh, an atrial arrhythmia. Um, so uh, I think I just confused myself with the vector. It just wouldn't function at all because it wouldn't divert through. But anyway, um, regardless, just make sure you plug, um, just make sure you plug the correct coil into the correct slot because it just messes with the vectors. Energy would still technically be, be delivered now that I think about it, but it just uh, wouldn't function correctly. Um, and a way you can tell, aside from obviously if it's in place, um, just check your EGM channels. So you can use the SVC EGM channel to determine if it's plugged into anything at all. And you can also check your impedances. Impedance is always a strong indicator of whether or not leads are, uh, are well connected. So if you have a high impedance uh, out of range from SVC to CAN, that's a strong indicator that your SVC is not being used, which is exactly how it should be in this case. Any questions at all, comments, my brilliant- Yes, AJ, can I, can I just say something? Yes, sir. Very good demonstration. Uh, yes, that yesterday case, um, the case was actually, when I was setting out for the case, it was a Medtronic lead I collect, uh, uh, I took, because it's Compia, with a metrolic, uh, I, a, a DF1 lead. So when I was, to, after the puncture, we, I got in trying to get in that metronic lead. It uh, the, the patient has a very severe tricuspid regurg. So it was giving some issues. So I pull it out, then ask for another DF1 lead. So <clears throat> the, my my uh, the assistants in the lab just went and pick this lead. I didn't even look at it. He picks it and open it. I asked, "Is it DF one?" He said, "Yes." So as he open it and I saw that it's a DF one, I didn't even check what um, what make is that DF one. So I put it in and he enter. I position and it goes. Things went well. So. When we finish the positioning, so it's to now come back. I opened the, uh, ask for the compia. Compia, the battery was brought, open it. So now, just as you show here, <clears throat> where the dot are, are the low voltages. So LV lead was positioned here, <clears throat> correct. Then the ROV, the, for the low voltage, I, uh, IS1, position it here. Then, uh, remember, I set out for that case with a Metronic uh, DF1. And that Metronic DF1 also have uh, SVC coil. But at the end of that case, it was a Biotronic I finally picked to do the case. So when I now position the other, um, uh, the, uh, the DF, um, the uh, the high voltage uh, ventricle, position it here. Then I wanted to position the other one, the one I called you was written, uh, it was written um, uh, IS1 atrium. That is what is written on it, IS1 atrium. Yeah, the one that will finally cap, IS1 atrium. So I took it to the uh, vote, uh, to the, um, so where the SVC is supposed to be, it did not fit in. Then I took it to where the atrium, where the atrium, uh, the atrial is supposed to be, and it fit in. But I knew that it's supposed not to be where the it's not it's not supposed to be where the A is because I have another lead already for the A. So to sort it out, and I said no, I have to make calls and find out this confusion before. I close this patient because if I do something wrong here, that patient has to come back to the cat lab. 
to reopen back again. So <laughs> that was why I called and you saved the day. Thank you for that. Happy to help. It was it, honestly you you threw me for a loop there because I, I forgot. I've never actually used one of these. Obviously, it's a different uh, manufacturer, so it took me a second too. Um, and then, I, oh yeah, okay. So you may see these, but they're not super common. Um, you mentioned the initial lead. Uh, you're having issues with it. Uh, can you kind of elaborate exactly what was going on? Just if no, something. I think that leads. I, I did that initial lead, I pass it through, even with the um, severe trichotomy regosh, it passed through. When I uh, when I tried to put it, I I point into multiple points. I wasn't getting in a good signal with that with that lead. That was what happened. So first, um, if you look at the sensing, it was not optimized at all. Once you connect, the sensing was not optimized. Then Another issue with that lead was that it was, I went into three different positions at the apex, then went into the, the lower septum. I was getting something of the vote, the, the, uh, the voltage that was less than three. Three, uh, uh, if you see, just a three, 2.5. And I was not happy with, um, with the arrow wave that we are picking up at that point. So what I did was that also, okay, and I said, get me another DF1. That was why that lead, because I was not telling them that it seemed that this lead has an issue. Mm -hmm. But what is the issue with the lead? I don't know. You know, these are leads that, um, uh, that have expired. So you don't know whether something is wrong with the lead. So I just say, get me another lead whether I can, let me test the same thing because we tested our cable wire and I felt that the cable wire was not the problem. How did I know that the cable wire was not the problem? When that lead was given that, I left it, positioned the uh, the, extra, uh, the extra lead. After positioning the extra lead, the sensing was fantastic. The P wave was, was, was good and everything was fine. EP dance, everything was fine. So why will I take the same cable wire and connect it to uh, the second lead and it's not giving me the same result? Wherever I go to, I still have problem with it. That was when I said, okay, let me take another lead and check whether is it the lead that is giving the trouble or not. So that was what led us to this uh, Linus. So we went with the Linus and we went into the lower, um, as 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 a symptom, and the results were very fantastic. So we left it there. And even when I was positioning the, after we positioned it, I was trying to cannulate the coronary sinus. It pulls out, but I so I just left it, cannulated the coronary sinus, positioned the uh the left sorry uh, left ventricular lead. I came back on screw it and position it back. At the same point, and it still gives fantastic uh, uh, parameters. So I felt that the lead may be the issue. That was how I conclude that way. Okay, interesting. Yeah, I, I think that is something that's noteworthy. There is that you know these leads are expected to work ten plus years, but that, that's inside of a human body as well, and we don't know what kind of conditions they've been stored in. Um, you know what kind of physical trauma they've had on the way to getting out here. Um, generally, I think they're well taken care of, but we just don't have mm -hmm. as much. So if you do have issues with a lead, um, you know, I, I definitely check your PSA, check your numbers, but it may ultimately be that there is something to, to look at um, and maybe try a different lead. Oh. So it looks like the one you used expired in 2015, but once again, it's still obviously very- But it's very fine. Yeah. Yes. It's and even yeah. that lead, that particular lead, I think that one, that Metronic lead expired 2021. That mm. one that we've ended up not using. It was 2021. And we didn't use it. The one of 2015 was very fantastic. Interesting. Well, I'm glad everything worked out. Um, perfect. So any questions yeah. about today? I know we took up like two hours plus of your day, so. All right. Well, 
thank you everybody for attending. Oh, really quick. Um, I came across this website while I was putting this together in the last couple of days. So how to pace.com uh, doesn't have a ton on there, but it's got some really cool walkthroughs. It even had something on shaping stylets for left bundle placement. So for those of you who are wanting to eventually learn left bundle, it never hurts to do some studying early. I just did my first left bundle case yesterday, actually. Um, wow. So. You know, I didn't talk about left bundle. Lab bundle is um, when that when I was talking about the devices. That is one of the things that you can use <laughs> for people who don't who have issue with. Uh, uh, you can't really get a good sensing and a good view or a good point or a fail uh, CRT. Uh, the option here is lab bundle. So lab bundle is a, is is a good option. Yeah. I think we're going to have some some talks coming up on this, so I hope everyone's uh, Yes, excited. I will ask uh, Dr. Dr. Ms. Apana to see whether she can talk on it next Sunday. Perfect. Yep. All right. Any, uh, any other questions from the group or anything like that? If not, we'll give you the rest of your evening back. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank Appreciate you, it. Dr. Jama. Have a great day. AJ, have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Mm.